Good morning, everyone. So we start our panel. It will be in two languages, English and Estonian. So let me uh, present our speakers today. I invite uh, Mart Trannut, who is uh, an Estonian linguist and a specialist in language policy. He will present the research awareness of human rights and security. Then our other, uh, other participants, Professor Ina Druviete, Professor of General Linguistics and Acting Vice Rector of the University of Latvia. Dr. Josep Soler Carbonel, Assistant Professor at the Department of English at Stockholm University, and he is fluent in Estonian, by the way. I must add this. Uh, Dr. Kristina Kallas, director of Narva College of the University of Tartu, specialist in human rights and integration. And uh, Rina Kajurand, research fellow of the International Center for Defense Studies. So, uh, our working order will be as follows. Uh, Mart Trannot will present the research for 15 minutes and then each of you have five minutes to present your deliberations on uh, uh, what you have just heard or just your general ideas on the subject. Then we have 35 minutes for discussion, so any ideas, anything you like to add. And then if we have time, we will take, well, five minutes or so a couple of short questions in the audience. Before we start, I would like to uh, throw in the, in, in, into the air, so to say, some topics. So you might, might start thinking about this. So one thing is uh, symbolic value of language. So um, appreciation of the symbolic value of, let us say, Estonian language does not necessarily correlate with proficiency in this language. So a person can be very proficient and at the same time can be very critical of values and vice versa. And so we need also other common values uh, in the society, not only the language. Then uh, the second topic I would like to introduce is delegation of responsibility and paternalist worldview, that means that the state should provide, uh, provide everything for uh, the acquisition of Estonian. So uh, everybody else is responsible, but not me, so to say. And then the third topic, does proficiency in Estonian decrease security risks in the sense that people who are well proficient, well, highly proficient in Estonian feel more secure, more confident, they can choose their sources of information, analyze and uh, interpret. So that's it and please, Mart Rannut. Tänä on võimalus eest tutvustada uh, meie uuringut Balti riikide venekeelne elanik on võimalused väljakutsed ja ohud ning see keskendub enne kõike Eesti olukorrale. Nii, uuring viidi läbi aastatel 2014-2015 ning teemadeks oli keelelised inimõigus küsimused, eesti keele kui riigi keele oskus, omandamine, kasutamine suhtluses ja asjaajamises ning selle vajalikus, kultuuriline ja sotsiaalne lõimumine, meedia jälgimine ja usaldamine, välis- ja julgeleku poliitilised vaated ning hinnangud Eesti lähiajaloole. Nii, esimese teema osas kõigepealt, siin on kaks küsimust. Üks on hinnang inimõigust olukorrale Eestis ja teine on isiklik kogemus. Teiste sõnadega teise küsimuse puhul uuritakse diskrimineerimist, kas inimene ise on seda kogenud. Ja nagu me näeme, siin on selles osas, kui võrde eesti keelne ja vene keelne elanikond erineb, vahe on seitsme korne 
just selle isikliku diskrimineerimise koha pealt. Mõnikad huvitavad faktid siin. Kõigepealt eestlaste hulgas, kus ülliselt isiklikult kogetakse marginaalselt mingit diskrimineerimist, on äkki see tase väga kõrge Ida-Virumaal, kus 18% Ida-Viruma vastajatest on Eesti vastajatest on kogenud sellist diskrimineerimist. Tõenäoliselt on see lihtsalt pettumus eesti keelse asjaajamise piiratuse või võimatuse tõttu. Seal lihtsalt toodi näiteid, kus kauplustes ei saa eesti keeles asju ajada. Kokkuvõttes võib öelda selle valdkonna kohta, et iga viies kuni seitsmes venekeelne elanik arvab, et teda on ebaõigleselt koheldud rahvuse tõttu ja selleks on enne kõike ebamugavused ja raskused venekeele kasutamisel asja ajamisel. Oma õiguste rikkumist rahvuse või emakele tõttu mainivad sagedamini just nooremad vanuserrühmad. Enne kõike need, kes on just lõpetanud kooli ja eriti Tallinnas. Ja siin on põhjuseks enne kõike see, et nii öelda see kooli lõppedes saadud eesti keele oskus ei vasta ühiskonna nõuetele. See tõttu kurdetakse raskusi töö leidmisel. Eesti keele vajalikusest. Selle puhul vajalikuks peetakse seda üldiselt. Isegi kõikide elanike puhul on see 74%, aga mõningates regioonides, kus eesti keelt eriti ei kasutata, ei hinnata ka seda. Näiteks Ida-Virumaal on natukene üle poole neid venekeelseid elanike, kes leiavad, et eesti keelt oleks tarvis osata. Kultuuriline ja ühiskondlik lõimumine. Siin uuriti vastajate teadmisi lasteraamatu ja multifilmi tegelasest lotest, ühest poplauljast, heliloojast, ühest tuntud filmi rõsissörist ja küsiti ka parlamendi erakonna kohta. Need on need nii nimetatud üldised teadmised mida harilikult inimesed teavad. Ja võrdlus aluseks oli see, kui võrd need teadmised vastavad Vene ja Eesti elanikuna puhul üksteisele. Kas need on sarnased või mitte? Ja vastus on väga kaugel teine teisest. Siin võib ehk mainida, et viiest kontrollküsimusest kolm vastas õigesti ära venekeelse elanikuna puhul 20% kus juures neid, kes eesti keelt ei osanud, nende hulgas siis 80% ei teanud ühtegi vastust. Seega ja veel üks fakt, need, kes eesti keelt hästi oskasid, need vastasid nagu eesti keele kõnelejad. Nii, keel ja kool. Hariduslik lõimumine. Siin tasuks ehk enne kõike silmas pidada seda, et eestikeelsed ja venekeelsed elanikud tegelikult tahavad, et nende lapsed käiksid samas koolis. Praegune süsteem ei rahulda, et kumbagi poolt. Ja üllatav on just see, et venekeelse elanikonna toetus on küllaltki suur nii põhikooli puhul kui ka gümnaasiumi puhul, et see oleks ühtne. Ühel juhul 60%, teisel puhul 67% vastajaid näevad ette sellist võimalust, et lapsed käiksid koos koolis, kus juures eeldatakse, et on olemas kindel nii nimetatud slavistika suund, kus siis on võimalik ka venekeelt õppida või mõningõid ained venekeeles. Nii, praegune olukord on kahtlemata põhjustanud teatud liiki segregatsiooni, mis on veel ehk jäänud 
sellest ammusest nõukogude ajast ning see on ehk signaaliks ka poliitikutele, et sellest on aeg lahti saada. Meedia ruum. Nii, maailmas toimuvate oluliste sündmuste puhul usaldavad venekeelsed vastajad rohkem Venema kui Eesti kanaleid. Ja see sõltub see eelistus sellest, et mida lihtsalt jälgitakse. Kui me vaatame seda skeemi, siis me näeme, et üks kolmandik venekeelsest elanikonnast usaldab Moskvast ja muudest kanalitest tulevad informatsiooni. Siis siin oleks see küllalki diplomaatilised vastamistes, näiteks, et ei oska öelda, ei usalda kumbagi, usaldatakse mõlemaid mõningal määral. Aga Eesti meedial kanaleid usaldab 5%, teiste sõnadega iga 20. Eesti venekeelne elanik. Siin me näeme just seda erinevust kanalite jälgimises. Nii, võtame julgoleku ja välispoliitika teemad. Siin oli mitu erinevad küsimust, mis puudutas nii kaasmaalaskonna suhtumist kaasmaalaskonda, Ukraina küsimust, NATO't ja mitmeid muid küsimusi. Kokku muide oli küsimusi 64. Nii, julgoleku küsimustes ja välispoliitikas jälle enamik väldib kategoorilisi seisukohti, aga üldiselt ja see tõttu ligi pool ei toeta näiteks Vene-Ukraina konfliktis kumbagi poolt. Väga tugev toetus on Vene kodakondsusega inimestel just Venema seisukohtadele Ukraina küsimustes. Võimalik vene agressioon Eesti vastu. See oli terav küsimus ja siin muidugi saadi ka küllatki konkreetsed vastused. Kõigepealt vene elanikond ei pea seda võimalikuks. Nimelt 2% on neid, kes arvavad, et see võiks kõne alla tulla. Kui me võrdleme siin Eesti elanikonna vastustega, siis see on 40%. Seega vahe on 20 kordne. Samal ajal eestlastes toetab NATO suuremat kohalolekut Eestis 83% ning 62% venekeelsest elanikonnast on selle vastu. Võtame ka sellise terava küsimuse lähiajaloost, nimelt kõik. Kas 1940. aastal toimus Eesti okupeerimine NSV Liidu poolt või mitte? Ja vastused. Ligi pool venekeelsest elanikonnast leiab, et Eesti astus vabatahtlikult NSV Liidu koos seisu. See, et on olemas ajaloolised faktid, see nagu sellist seisukohta ei mõjuta. See tõttu me saame rääkida siin mitte teadmistest või nende puudumisest, vaid teatud hoiakust ja selle väljandamisest. Uuring näitab, et julgeoleku poliitilistes seisukohtadest on ühisosa eestikeelsete ja venekeelsete elanike vaadetes minimaalne. Valdavalt on vaated vastandatud. Lähme järelduste juurde. Kõigepealt... Normaalne oleks, et riigis eristuvad vaated just kodakondsuse alusel. Et ühed on need, kes on saanud kodakondsuse, nad on lojaalsed, nad on nii öelda kuuluvad juba rahvuslikult mainstreami sellesse põhivoolu, kes mõtleb samamoodi. Eestis seda kahjuks siia nii ei ole. Vastandatus toimub keele alusel. See, mida peetakse ema keeleks, see, mis on kodu keeleks. Mida rohkem, mida parem on eestikeele oskus, seda väiksem on see vahe eestlastega. 
ning lisaks veel eesti keele oskuse vajaduse tajumine seostub edukusega ühiskonnas. Seega need venekeelsed elanikud, kes mõtlevad nagu eesti keelsed, kad neil on kõrge palk, kõrg haridus ja elukoht Tallinnas. Eesti keele oskamist peetakse oluliseks, aga inimeste endi hinnangul nende keeleoskus eriti kõrge ei ole. Seda valdab vabalt ehk 13% ja 25% enam vähem, aga üldse ei vasta keelt 12% vastanutest. Muide siin tuleb muidugi tähele panna, et see on isiklik arvamus ja inimestel on omadus luisata. Ja uurisime ka seda, et kui palju inimesed selles küsimuses luiskavad, palusime märkida, et mis tasemel nad on eksame ära teinud. Ja pakkusime välja kaks taset, kus mida tegelikult riiklikult ei mõõdeta, A1 ja C2. Ja siis tuli välja, et rahvas luiskab. Ja võt selline retooriline küsimus, mis te arvate, kas mehed luiskavad rohkem või naised? Ja õige vastus on, mehed luiskavad ja peaaegu kaks korda rohkem kui naised. Nii et iga seitsmes mees pakkus enda kategooriaks sellist, mida polnud kunagi mõõdetud ja iga kahedeiskümnes naine. Natukene ehk ka venekele oskusest, et mõõtsime ka seda ja just selle vajalikust. Tuleb välja, et venekeelne elanikond peab seda tähtsaks, et see venekeele oskus oleks olemas. Ja põhjuseks on ka väga lihtne asi, seda eeldatakse teenindusel asja ajamisel ja nii edasi. Ja see muide on kujundanud ka teatud käitumise, sellise nii nimetatud õpitud abituse, et kus isegi ei kasutata oma eesti keele oskust. Et isegi hea eesti keele oskusega venekeelsed elanikud kasutavad ainult pooltel juhtudel oma eesti keelt, kuigi teeninduses läheb ju tarvis eesti keelt alg tasemel. Teiste sõnadega 80% venekeelsest elanikonnast peaks igal juhul alati hakkama saama. Nii, lõpetuseks mõningad faktid. Kõigepealt eesti keele oskust ei kasutata. See ei vii eesti keele kasutamisele. Ja just selle paralleelse venekeelse suhtlusruumi tõttu ning tekib õpitud abituse sündroom, millest on siiski tarvis lahti saada. Järjest suuremaks probleemiks muutub keelepõhine eraldatus ühiskonnas ning selle eraldatuse, selle lõhestamise kõrvaldamine peab olema Eesti riigis prioriteet. Aitäh! Thank you very much for this thorough uh, presentation. Now we have time to discuss. Uh, please, Ina Trubieta, uh, five minutes. And please follow the clock there. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for me to represent your neighboring country, Latvia, and uh, Latvian sociolinguists. Maybe somebody wonder why sociolinguistics, why language issues when we speak about uh, human rights. Because language matters. Language is not only means of communication, it's, known, it's not only an instrument. Language has huge symbolical value. And the key term we use in present discourse about language policies uh, is symbolic value of a language linguistic attitudes because language attitudes mean a lot 
language attitudes uh, form our actual practices in language use. And language use has been subjected not only to objective indicators as language skills, but also to personal attitudes, stereotypes, beliefs, and language uh, forms so-called space of information. And one of the main problems both for Latvian and Estonian societies is the divided space of information. And it's not only linguistically divided, it's also divided by contents, by attitudes, by stereotypes, by different perceptions of histories and so on. We have cooperated with Estonian sociolinguists for years. And we also conducted a research about language used among Russian-speaking population. These are not only ethnic Russians. In Latvia and Estonia, the notions ethnic minority and linguistic minority do not coincide. And uh, now we can draw some conclusions about similarities and differences between Latvia and Estonia. Uh, similarities, raising percentage of language skills. Uh, in Latvia, maybe surprisingly, a bit better than in Estonia. So in our country, only 8% of respondents declared having no Latvian language skills among the youngest generation. Yes, uh, language skills are almost 98% and most of them at very good and uh, uh, good uh, level. The uh, second difference, language use. We have managed to have language proficiency among Russian-speaking population, but our common problem is language use. And we should uh, say that the main problem is uh, that language skills up to now couldn't produce uh, better language attitudes, and we couldn't uh, overcome this issue of divided informational space. And uh, during uh, the discussion, I would like to stress two issues. One is the impact of uh, current refugee crisis, Ukrainian events uh, to language attitudes among Russian-speaking population. And uh, there are some very interesting observations. And the other issue would be uh, the impact of educational system. So uh, we have much more experience in introducing bilingual education, and indeed it's our success story, story but now we have to decide how to develop this in the future. And I am absolutely sure that this uh, seemingly linguistic discourse would add a very necessary dimension to our uh, common understanding of uh, human rights and our, to our common efforts to build uh, inclusive and integrated societies against the background of the official state language. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Joseph, please. Thank you. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's indeed a great pleasure and an honor to be participating at this conference, being back uh, to this city where I lived for six years. I don't live here anymore now, of course, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, in these first five minutes of my talk, uh, what I would like to uh, introduce is one main idea, which will hopefully touch upon several of the points that Anna was suggesting uh, for discussion. And... Um, I'll build up on, on that. Um, so, I think in uh, contemporary sociolinguistics, uh, one of the ideas that uh, is currently stressed more and more is the idea of uh, seeing language as a practice. So, to get away a little bit more of the idea of language as a bounded object with the certain rules governed by certain grammatical features and vocabulary and so on, but rather look at the practice uh, feature of the language and to see what people actually do with their languages, what kind of uh, activities they conduct and so on. So, um, because every uh, language use comes in, in certain specific domains, 
which are governed by particular rules and norms in that domain that maybe don't really work in other domains. And I'm sure that uh, this, is an this is an experience that we can all relate to. Um, we don't speak the same way when we are at home with our family than when we are at uh, work with our colleagues or when we are uh, uh, with our friends in our leisure time and so on. And so um, this is even in uh, monolingual uh, contexts, right? So um, there is diversity of situations entails diversity of language use and language patterns. In multilingual contexts, uh, this is even more complicated because then what you have is that the speakers can draw from different linguistic resources from different languages. And that's why you get uh, people using all languages at the same time instead of using one language at a time. And this is something that you can observe uh, in many different settings nowadays. And that's why contemporary social linguistics, I think, is focusing more and more on this. And the current trending topic concept, so to say, is uh, translanguaging. That is uh, using all languages at the time. Okay. Uh, I, I do all this introduction uh, to remark that one of the things that comes out from the report is to say that uh, those uh, who report better uh, Estonian language skills uh, also have particular features and characteristics uh, correlate to age, uh, to place of residence, to uh, level of studies, and so on. And, and that is, I suppose, not a surprise if we see language as practice. If we see uh, that these people probably engage on an everyday basis in particular activities and particular uh, actions that they do uh, in the Estonian language that is more meaningful to them. And so, um, if we are to foster this better level of the Estonian language, which leads into better possibilities for integration and better uh, socioeconomic prospects, I suppose one way to go about it is to promote uh, more meaningful contexts of language use, where the, the, the language is, as I say, more meaningfully uh, used. Um, and so if there's one thing that the state can possibly think of is to probably then say uh, what contexts can we enhance or foster where people from different linguistic backgrounds can uh, interact in more meaningful ways. Possibly that could be, for example, schools. And this is something that also emerges from the report. I was interested to, to see that people have a positive attitude towards actually having uh, schools for everyone in general, so schools for children, not schools for uh, Estonian children or schools for Russian-speaking children, but schools in general. That, that is to say where people could then mix more organically and more naturally and to start doing things together in, in a more uh, natural way, I suppose. And so, um, yeah, this is the, the, the main idea, I suppose, that I would like to highlight in, in this first introduction from me, so this first five minutes of getting away from language as a set of rules, grammatical uh, uh, features and vocabulary, etc., and to actually focus more on what people do with their languages and how they achieve their aims, um, which may lead to certain common values. So it's, as Anna was saying at the beginning, it's, it's not just about the language, but it's about more than that. So language is usually a uh, an excuse to talk about other things usually all the time. So, uh, but I think I will leave it at, at this for the moment. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And Christina, please. <coughs> um, thank you also for the opportunity to talk and um, uh, reflecting on Mart's presentation, I would actually like to focus on language policy and language rights rather than language use because a lot has been said about the language use, but um, the discussion is also important how the state promotes or doesn't promote the, the language use through the laws. And um, I'm from Narva. Well, this is not a diagnosis, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but it's like a position I would like to take. I'm, I'm putting on the hat of Estonian Russian speaker, uh, and I'm trying to present Narva and the Russian speakers in this panel, if I may. Uh, I have partly the right to do so because part of my identity is Russian and part of my identity is Estonian. And, and I speak both languages fluently, which means that I'm taking the position here uh, of a Russian speaker. 
and I would like to just present um, uh, the position of how the Russian speakers might see the whole discussion about the language issue uh, in Estonia and probably in many other post-Soviet uh, territories. And um, when looking at the Estonian population, one might say that uh, the, the policy should aim rather at achieving some kind of a perfect bilingualism balance because the population is uh, largely divided into two large, equally large linguistic groups and um, from the outsider, uh, the most logical conclusion would be that, okay, the state language policy should aim at the balance, at some kind of a perfect balance between those two main dominant languages, which we know is not the case in Estonia. So the state policy in Estonia is uh, strongly oriented towards uh, protective, providing protective rights to Estonian language, which is absolutely understandable from the situation where this policy is coming from. So, uh, and I think as we saw also from uh, Mart's presentation that uh, even majority of the Russian speakers don't question the right of Estonian language protection and the use of Estonian language. But from the, from the position of the Russian speakers, uh, this kind of a protective language rights uh, policy towards Estonian language is, is seen as uh, assimilation-oriented language rights, which means that the state uh, aims to uh, position one language into the dominant position and assimilate linguistically uh, all the residents into one uh, language in the country. And at the same time, the usage of the Russian language in the public sphere has been diminishing constantly since 1990s from the position it had before and to the position it is today, it has shrinked significantly. And of course, from the psychological perspective of those people who are Russian native speakers, taking away certain rights is, is always psychologically hard to accept. You know, it's always happy if you're given the rights, but when you're taking away certain rights, is always a psychological process which is not easy to, to go through. So one of the difficulties of the Russian speakers to accept the language policy is not the fact that they, would accept, they wouldn't accept the right of Estonian language to be protected and, and dominant, but they, they have a hard time accepting the right of diminishing the right to use Russian in a public sphere. So these are two conflictual issues that, that are for this community very hard to handle and, and, and they haven't found the balance, uh, the balance yet. Um, as we saw from the presentation, uh, the language, uh, one thing is to accept the right of Estonian language to the protection and usage. The other is actually the real usage and the knowledge of this language. But um, I would like to actually add um, that uh, the situation is not that bad in Estonia because uh, uh, here in the presentation, the results were not distributed, divided by the age groups. But when we, when we divide those language knowledge and language skills, Estonian language skills into age groups, we also come out the results which integration monitoring studies show that among the young Russian speakers under the age of 24, basically people who were born and grew up already in uh, independent Estonia, there is only 1% who claim that they don't understand. So this is, this is a huge difference compared to the older generation which has uh, uh, different abilities probably also to acquire the language. So the situation in terms of accepting Estonian language rights by the Russian speakers and also acquiring the skills is, is not so bad as we will see. Now the question is how to find this balance, what, I'm, what I was trying to say, um, uh, between uh, protecting the Estonian language but also not uh, uh, diminishing significantly the rights of the Russians to use their own language. This is very tricky, I, I, I understand, and I'm not a politician, so luckily I'm not in a hard position to actually find this balance. But uh, in one of the spheres in, in Estonia where this balance is sought after, uh, and, and, and which, which we see how difficult it is, is exactly the education. So Estonian state has been trying, and trying hard, to find this perfect balance between uh, providing an, uh, the mastering Estonian language for the for the graduates of Estonian school system and at the same time helping to maintain the Russian language as a mother tongue of the native speakers. I don't know how successful we will be in this education modeling. Uh, it's time to tell, but I hope that uh, this will be something that we learn also for the public sphere, how to find this balance also in the public sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please, uh, Lina. Thank you. 
Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, my role is to add the security aspect to the conversation. And um, I would like to start with responding to, to this uh, study that has been conducted. And um, my first response, response would be that uh, the results were not really surprising um, because we, the, these results reflected the results uh, that have been presented in previous studies and uh, that also came out from a study that the ICDS uh, conducted uh, a couple of months earlier. Our study was a little bit more qualitative than quantitative, but the results were pretty much the same. Um, and the results also uh, actually support at least one of the threat scenarios that is very often discussed here in Estonia. And this is whether the Russian-speaking minority would give Russia an incentive to attack Estonia or to stage an incident um, uh, in order to launch a military attack. And, uh, and actually, this is, uh, um, this is a very complicated issue because uh, when we see the results, then in a way, uh, many of the preconditions for such a thing to happen are there. Um, people feel alienated from the society. People feel discriminated. Uh, people feel that their rights are not protected. And they uh, live in diff different information space from, from that uh, of Estonians. Uh, but in a way, I think this is a very severe simplification of the problem. And uh, this is where I see the difference between the study conducted here and the study that we conducted uh, and that was based on uh, more like in-depth interviews. When people acknowledge that, yes, we, uh, we actually we live in different information space, we get most of our information from Russian news, but this does not necessarily mean that we would raise weapons against Estonia or we would provoke something or we actually love Putin. Uh, so in that sense, this uh, picture is, uh, is a little bit more complicated. And when it, comes to, when it comes to security, then the most important question is not language, it's the question of loyalty. And loyalty and language are not necessarily connected uh, to each other. Um, because people who understand Estonian but do not speak Estonian, um, I mean, they support. And when we talk of these other values that we, that we lack, then actually, I wouldn't say that we lack the other values or, or common issues. I think that these people very much enjoy living in Estonia because they have uh, freedom of speech, they have access to uh, medical care, they have access to education, they have access to traveling all around Europe. Um, so actually, they value these things. So it's not about not having common values. Uh, but. Uh, as we talk about actually the language and, and security, then I would uh, distinguish between uh, Estonians and, uh, and Russians in a way that for Estonians, the language issue is, uh, is very important because this is basis for, for the Estonianness, starting from identity and, uh, and actually ending with the independent state. And that's, that's why our language policy is very conservative. While for Russian speakers, I mean, why or when is language a threat or, or security threat for them? This is probably when, uh, when a crisis arrives. And when you live in, a, in an environment where you do not really understand what is going on around you, this becomes a risk, a security risk. Um, so I would say that... Uh, um, well, in, in the military, it's a different thing. In, uh, for example, uh, Russian-speaking uh, young men serving in Estonian military, um, they need to know the language because otherwise this would become fatal for them in a, in a moment of crisis 
or, for example, even handling your weapons if they don't understand Estonian language in instructions. Uh, but yes, uh, other than that, I, I think that, uh, that Russian speakers haven't had the need, really, to, to know the language. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, 35 minutes to discuss them. There's been enough uh, interesting issues that we can take further. Uh, well, I think everyone has mentioned the importance of this common information space. Uh, m uh, maybe not in the, exactly in the same terms, but uh, uh, that uh, well, whatever language we read or watch news in, uh, we uh, are not in completely segregated, separated spaces. And, well, Ina suggested that, yes, if I understand you correctly, that education can be a key factor there. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Uh, yes, education, but not only language teaching and no, no, learning. In a more general term. Yes, and uh, no, uh, we are involved in intensive discussions about the contents of education. Is it pos possible to strengthen, let's say, patriotic feelings, understanding about the necessity to have the state uh, where the Latvian language is the state language, what does it mean to be loyal to the country. So we are involved in these discussions almost endlessly. And we, both politicians and sociolinguists, have to solve this uh, dilemma. And it's indeed a dilemma how uh, to promote both inclusive society at the background of the Latvian language and at the same time to protect linguistic human rights of Russian speakers in the situation where the Russian speakers experience so-called linguistic self-sufficiency and uh, our newcomers, uh, refugees, are very well aware about uh, the different market or economic value of the languages and are supposed uh, uh, to uh, be doing everything to join this bigger community, Russian-speaking community. Also, we have to mention that uh, this, let's say, refugee factor uh, is uh, uh, like a positive uh, factor for uh, recognizing the identification with the Latvian states. So we have this Tertium Comparationis, which show, yes, we are, let's say, Europeans, Christians, and so on. And surprisingly, it benefits to the learning of the Latvian language, but it's a negative factor uh, for usage of the Latvian. In Latvia, in difference for, uh, from Estonia, we still resist the creation of separate Russian-speaking public TV channel. And yesterday we discussed the reasons. Yes, I'm also against this because of several reasons. One is uh, we uh, widen the Russian language space in the information uh, channels, which is huge. We have approximately 20 Russian language channels available in Latvia and only, let's say, three in uh, Latvian. The second, uh, each could be detrimental to forming language attitudes. If you see, let's say, for Latvians uh, discussing issues in Russian, to my mind, it uh, would diminish uh, the uh, uh, prestige of the Latvian language. So we could use interpretation, we could use subtitles, but we have to observe the law that uh, Latvians have the rights to use Latvian everywhere and always when uh, in their mother uh, country. And this problem, accommodation of Latvian speakers to Russian language space is even critical because our uh, young people don't know Russian and it's uh, very difficult for them to find a job. 
because employers are still demanding Russian language skills. And there is a paradox. So there is no discrimination of Russian speakers, but there is a discrimination for Latvian language speakers. And we have to uh, overcome this obstacle. And later, I may uh, maybe say some words about the uh, referendum about uh, the Russian as a second uh, state language. It failed, but anyway, we still feel its impact. And uh, another issue, the preamble of the constitution to uh, um, uh, Latvian Republic, where the word language had been mentioned for three times. And all this together came, uh, formed this linguistic attitude, common linguistic attitude and stereotypes, and against the background of these global processes, not only sociolinguistic ones, but political ones, we must uh, have new approach to these language issues too. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Christina, you if want I may, to uh, yes, add please. to this debate about uh, language, information space loyalty because these are the words used here a lot and um, it's very sim simplified understanding that this is kind of a linear process that you you learn the language you enter the Estonian language information space and then you become loyal that's not how it works in real life so it's not linear a process at all uh, Estonian language knowledge uh, of course, helps you to enter the Estonian information space, but it doesn't mean that the outcome is ultimate loyalty or, for example, acceptance of all the values that Estonian uh, cultural space uh, is valuing. So it's much more complicated, as Rina was trying to say, uh, from the perspective of the Russian speakers. There are the research is Estonian uh, integration monitoring, monitoring study shows that. Uh, 34% of the Russian speakers use Estonian language media regularly, not Estonian Russian language media, but Estonian language media regularly, but they don't trust it. So again, this is like you, you, you know the language, you read the news, but you still don't trust it And uh, when it comes, for example, to Ukrainian crisis. So, uh, and for them, uh, design, de developing these loyalties and, and integration is much more complicated process that involves not only language acquisition, but integration into the value systems. And this is already a, a completely different story, a little bit long, which your research a little bit covered because, uh, because it was about uh, uh, practical uh, likeness to live in Estonia because this is European, less bureaucratic, less corrupt and so on. But then you have this emotional linguistic connection to Russia and how to make those things combined so that you would feel loyal. This is also a problem. Yeah, well, thank you very much for mentioning it. And uh, well, the non-linearity of uh, this issue, and exactly this is what I suggested in the very beginning, that proficiency in Estonian does not necessarily mean uh, accepting the core values, let's say, of um, the Estonian, well, eth in Estonian in the ethno-linguistic sense of society. But there is also this thing maybe, I, I'm afraid we are entering a very uh, unsecure ground here, but there is this complex issue of Russian, I mean, in linguistic sense, then Soviet, imperial, and everything like this. So I'm afraid so that for many people, all these things have merged into one conglomerate. Uh, but maybe there is a way that could um, uh, help us all, uh, to create some agreement and uh, harmony, so to say, in the society, so separating this into, look, Russian does not mean Soviet and doesn't mean imperial and so on and so on. So, and also among Russian speakers, so being a Russian speaker doesn't mean being a, an automatically a supporter of, uh, well, things, the things Soviet and so on, maybe this is... Uh, I don't want to take a time, but just one comment. We had a Ukrainian Academy, uh, Academy of Science visitor in Narva, and he said uh, one very interesting thing when I asked him, what is your impression of Narva and Estonia in general? And he said, you know what, this is the first time in last two years uh, since the conflict with Russia happened in Ukraine that I made peace inside of me with Russian language. That 
I actually saw a Russian language that is not imperialistic, that is not Soviet, that is very European. And, and this is a European Russian, Russian language speakers that I would like to see in Ukraine. So he, as a foreigner, reflected on this distangling from Soviet imperialist talk and the Russian language, which, which for us sometimes is too much connected, but it's really not anymore, especially with the younger generation. Yes, uh, uh, Joseph, you wanted to add something. Yes. Yeah, I suppose also it would be worth... Uh, very interesting things have been said already in uh, terms of how to find a balance between these identity dilemmas of uh, um, working on different sets of values and different conglomerates. Um, to bring in something new into the discussion, maybe I, I guess uh, being an outsider, I, I'm allowed to, to do that a little bit more, to also reflect on on the attitudes and, and the ideologies, the opinions of uh, the Estonian counterpart. All right, so uh, th this is a, a two-sided uh, issue and um, there are always uh, at least two players in, in, in the game, if not more. And the state can go into some areas, but in liberal, uh, modern uh, liberal democracies, it cannot go into everywhere. So uh, it's also an issue of, of the mindset of uh, everyone involved and to see to what extent uh, different profiles of speakers and different uh, ways of speaking and using the language are also awarded legitimacy and uh, I think to, to some extent uh, this is also something that uh, the state and, and, and the population in, in the country will want to or uh, might want to, to reflect to later on. So what what uh, is their role actually in, in this uh, achieving a, a, a more integrated uh, and more cohesive uh, society at the end? Uh, well, maybe some reaction from that side. Uh, uh, Mark and uh, Rina. Okay. Uh, well, either of you. Uh, I wanted to uh, react actually to something that Ina said and something that you, Christina, said that <coughs> actually when it comes to to Russians uh, who, uh, who consume different channels of information than what came out very clearly from our study and also from some, some previous studies is that Russians do not trust any channels. They do not trust Russian information 100% and they do not trust Estonian ones. So they switch to, to some, uh, some BBC uh, Russian language channels and, uh, and they, uh, it boils down to the point when they actually pick up a phone and call to their friends in Ukraine or Russia to find out what is actually going on. Uh, so I, uh, I'm not saying that all our Russian speakers are brainwashed completely by Russian media. Another thing I wanted to point out was uh, uh, that Ina said that you actually decided not to open up uh, a Russian language uh, TV channel in, in Latvia while we did it here in Estonia and uh, my opinion is that this is a good thing because, uh, um, first of all, in troubled times, uh, the need for news media increases and the manipulation with the news and information increases as well. And I think that uh, in a time when Russia pours basically um, money and resources into information campaigns, um, then we we also can come out with our version of truth in the Russian language. And this does not e exclude that we do all the other policies in parallel, like education and so on. But I don't see this as a counter-propaganda in any way. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we are running out of time. So Mark, maybe the last remark, and then, yes, then we will have a couple of questions from the audience, and we will round it up. Just one point. Uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, knowing some language doesn't make anyone a patriot of anything connected to this language. So we have to speak about linguistic community, meaning uh, knowledge of language, attitudes, common attitudes I mean, and common behavior patterns. It means also cultural background knowledge, the so-called mass culture. So language is the first step towards uh, belonging uh, to this uh, language community, an obligatory step. 
but several steps must follow. So one must integrate into this com community. In our Estonian case, we do have to deal with this uh, attitudinal delay with the imperial Soviet past in, uh, in some minds of people. We have to uh, fight uh, against uh, these um, mental, uh, mental attitudes that have come along uh, from generation to generation. And uh, here, uh, Russian media, local Russian media, uh, has a, a very uh, challenging task, as uh, this media has to cater for the needs of Russian-speaking population, but not for mental attitudes that are anchored in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we will take, I'm afraid, one or two brief questions. So, yes, please, you have a question over there. Uh, hello, I, um, I'm Lymanus from Lithuania. I'm a Soldiers' Rights Defense Center General Director and a part of Presidium in Euromil. Um, and uh, this day when we are celebrating human rights, uh, I would like to ask some people to be patient to the other opinions and to understand the essence of human rights, especially the right for expression. Actually, somebody knows uh, me from two years ago when I raised one question. And today I was informed that some people said that I uh, asked the organizers not to send me invitation to that event. Actually, uh, I'm for human rights and I'm very glad that uh, the organizers invited me. And uh, the question was, uh, I think, so uh, for me important. And uh, I, I want to invite you to, to, to be patient and uh, to like uh, opinion pl pluralism. So the question. Uh, because I'm from Lithuania and uh, there is no, uh, uh, no, no information about Lithuanian situation in that case, we have uh, the, uh, one situation. Uh, the state security duty chief, new chief, uh, put in the media information that uh, from 3,000 uh, servicemen, some of them can raise weapon against Lithuania. But uh, that uh, new chief didn't put any evidence uh, in the media uh, uh, about uh, why he thinks. And one of the evidence was Facebook photo. And uh, the question... Uh, Can you be more precise, yeah. please? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I want to thank Rina, who said that uh, uh, if you are Russian, it's not uh, the reason to, to think that you are against uh, your nation. And um, I think uh, I would like to hear your opinion to, uh, is it normal to put in uh, national media that information without evidence, with our internal, uh, internal affairs ministry permission uh, about, that, about that some of uh, service security duty servicemen can raise weapon against Lithuania. And uh, they didn't put any normal evidences. And uh, I think that the man manipulation in media uh, for, in favor for politicians' goals, in my opinion, it's not good well, for I'm national sorry, security. What is the question? question? Maybe I would ask short evaluation of Lithuanian example. Uh, is it good to, to put uh, uh, in the media very serious sec uh, touching security questions? without media against minorities. Well, thank you. Uh, one more question. We will have answers uh, to all questions. Yes, please. Maria Andrika from the Ministry of Education. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, Mart, you mentioned uh, very briefly about the uh, connection between the socioeconomic background and the uh, sense of belonging and um, and the language skills and, and the information space so but i didn't quite uh, get the exact correlation or, or what was the uh, what was the idea on that or what was the uh, result that you found on that correlation okay. yes and maybe one more question and then there will be answers if there are no questions, then please, any of you, please volunteer to answer the questions. Yes, 
You're smart. You are willing yeah. to, or you, you, Rina, yes? Uh, I think this one question was addressed to me, mainly. Um, well, the security question, yes? yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, um, I think that well, there are two sides. Uh, one is that, indeed, we shouldn't jump into conclusions uh, right away, starting to accuse all the Russian speakers of being traitors and being a, a potential security risk. So we cannot do it in advance. Uh, and uh, if somebody did this on an official website uh, of your MODs uh, or a governmental website, then I think that it's, uh, it's not maybe a correct way of, of doing this. Another thing is that radical elements are present in all the societies. And uh, loyalty is one thing that is almost impossible to measure. Uh, you can only measure it when the risk really arise, arises. So, and, and let's hope that it will never arise in a way that we have to test the loyalty of, of our Russian-speaking minorities. Thank you. And the second question, you, Mark. Yes, please. Yes, so the second question was about uh, the connection uh, between uh, linguistic background and social and economic background concerning... Uh, 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 the vicinity uh, towards the uh, uh, Estonian linguistic community. So, um, I mentioned in my um, presentation that uh, those Russian speakers who have higher education, who have uh, a high salary, and who uh, tend to uh, live in uh, the capital of Estonia in Tallinn, they uh, their views are quite similar to uh, the views of Estonians. And uh, this was one of the outcomes of the survey. And it is uh, quite natural, as uh, these people have to use Estonian in their work all the time. They have, to, uh, they have uh, studied in the university Estonian more than enough. And uh, that's why they also uh, share the views, attitudes, and their behavior is quite similar to those of uh, Estonians. Thank you very much, and I thank all our panelists. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, thank you.